Hi ho, everybody! It's Kermit the Grog here, uh, bringing you another blast from the past. If you did not check the last one out, this is uh, my old podcast, Pop Culture Talk Zone, um, that I did with my lovely friends in the Weeb Cabal before uh, Brad decided to take the reins and make it that time I got reincarnated. So, on this episode, we talk about why we in the general pop culture population like uh, re- uh, reformed villains or just villains in general that kind of grow over time. So, listening back to this, this one was actually. Uh, I was really proud of this one, uh, so I would definitely say uh, go give a listen to it because I don't think I've really heard anybody else talk about some of the ideas we get to in it. So, yeah, I think this was a good one. Uh, the f- I mean, they're all good ones. Let's be well, real. But yeah. This one, like this one, was at the time when I re-listened to it. I'm like, I'm going to do a panel about this. So, and and this was one. You know, the first one we did with Canon, we definitely t- touched on anime a bunch, but this one we sort of did more of a focus on anime because you have your characters, Vegeta and Bakugo and all them um, that you can sort of go a little bit deeper on. So this, I I think this was the one where we sort of more solidified, like, Oh, we're going to do an anime podcast in the future. Definitely. I mean, I feel like every episode of pop culture talk zone is just a step towards what we will be doing now. So, but yeah, go check it out. It's good stuff. And by check it out, <laughs> just that. keep listening. Just keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> check it out by keep going. And uh, hopefully, my remaster of this uh, makes it good and listenable. Um, the recording mechanisms we were using back then were not as sophisticated as they do. Current... Get, every episode gets better. Yeah. Every episode uh, you can you can listen in real time as we release each old. Uh, archive episode how we get a little bit better at doing what we're doing i don't remember which one it is it might be the last one um where we started using the real equipment i think it's the last one yeah so So. you'll definitely be able to hear as we go through this but hopefully my my remastering is is high quality enough so yeah enjoy i was also there (laughs) (laughs) it's the kermit zone with our very special guest star you the listener yeah It's time to fetch your headphones. It's time to check the mics. It's time to chat pop culture on the Kermit Zone tonight. It's time now for a shake-up. It's time to go sit tight. It's time to start recording on the Kermit Zone tonight. Why do we always come here? I guess we'll never know. It's like a kind of torture to have to tape the show. It's time to get things started on the most sensational, conversational, observational, confrontational. This is what we call the Kermit Zone. Welcome, everybody. Weeb Club is back with another pop culture talk zone coming at you. Uh, it's me. It's always me. It's never not me. Gosh darn it. Can't you just get away? It's me, Kermit the Grog. Uh, with my two wonderful friends from Anime Club, Ben. Hello. And Brad. Hi. Uh, we had such a good time recording last time that we were like, hey, that was fun. Let's do it again. And you know, who am I not to beat a dead horse? Yep. Uh, <laughs> Andrew Andrew got me with hashtag content, and I just had to had to keep going. Yeah, can't escape it. Ben already, ben already had the bug. I obviously had the bug. Now Brad's infected. I will never miss an opportunity to hear the sound of my own voice. <laughs> and with Brad's new setup, I can do that better than ever. True, true. Yeah, coming at you a nice uh, higher def now, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. But enough of that. Today, we are talking about the concept of reformed villains and why we are kind of so uh, drawn to them as like a concept, like more than a hero. I feel like we have uh, a lot of situations like that. And I guess what sparked this particular one off, not that we haven't run into a million times, is... Uh, we all watch a, a show, an anime called My Hero Academia, which is basically the basic concept is that everybody in the world, or most everybody in the world, has something called a quirk, which is basically like a small superpower. Um, some of them are simpler or weirder than others. Some of them are a lot more straightforward. Um, but specific to this one, because you're following kids going to a school for this, there is a character named Bakugo who, well, isn't a villain, kind of follows the line of, like, he's kind of a jerk, 
kind uh, of. Yeah, I guess that's putting it lightly. He's very much a jerk. So the thing that specifically prompted it is we're like, what, five seasons into it now? So uh, over 100 yeah. episodes. What what did we just watch? One, 102. 102. Um, and like he's watching his growth is one of my favorite things. But we kind of gloss over the fact that like in one of the first episodes... He literally goes tell goes to tell our main character to go die and to go kill himself. And it's like, how do we just, how do I go, oh, I love this guy. I hope he gets better. And just like, if somebody did that in real life, I'd be really cross with them. Like, why, I guess, well, we'll open up with that question. Why do you think we're so connected to his journey and kind of can gloss over those moments of bigger villainy? I mean, not as big in this case. We'll get to some other heavy hitters later on that are a little bit more uh, intense than even like saying even if just saying "go kill yourself" is lower on the scale of things we'll be talking about. Yeah. But so I I have what I've been calling a thesis on on this general concept of like why media as a whole likes a an antihero, a reformed villain, even just a regular villain who does cool things and maybe isn't the biggest villain there's uh, and especially in recent years so i i don't want to really uh you know dump the whole thing out right out the gate but um that's sort of where my mind is going with a lot of this is that there's there's something about human psychology that enjoys the act of seeing someone doing something bad you know, which is obviously a big spectrum, but then sympathizing with them or, you know, seeing them turn good, so to speak. There's, it's something that's been going on for so long. Um, one of the big ones we've talked about before is Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z, who at the beginning of Dragon Ball Z was literally the main villain murdering large chunks of Earth's population. Right. And then, basically, after the, what, first season? It was, like, at the end of the first season. He gets defeated, but is still alive, comes back in the next season as still a villain, but also fighting against the main villain of the second season, in which time he sort of becomes part of the the main group he never stops being a jerk but he does do heroic things and vegeta is a lot of people's favorite character yeah vegeta is my favorite character um so i'll ask you then okay why do you think he's your favorite character the interesting thing is he's my favorite character though probably more because he's a villain than because he reformed. I like Vegeta's drive. I like his breaking the rules attitude. I like the fact that he just... He goes in there and he does the things you want to do sometimes. It sucks when he's on the wrong side. But when he's cooperating with the heroes, he's he's not a hero himself. He's delivering the lines and taking the actions that you wish the good guys would take but they're hampered by their good guy attitudes they they constantly offer people a second chance there's no second chances with vegeta vegeta doesn't like you you're on the wrong side of him he kills you and there's something cathartic about that now in there there's two things with vegeta to go a little further into his story is Dragon Ball Z is split up into arcs centered around a main villain. There is an arc towards the end of the show where Vegeta finally does do something purely self-sacrificing. He he blows himself up in an effort to kill the main bad guy. He gets nothing out of it. And at the end, he delivers kind of like the only compassionate thing he ever says in the entire series up until that point. That he's doing it for his family that he's had on Earth. Up until that point, he doesn't even seem to care about his family. So that's like a moment of redemption. And then, that's kind of the end of the show. Dragon Ball comes back with Dragon Ball Super, 
And I would say in Dragon Ball Super, Vegeta is reformed. And he's a lot less edgy. He's a, a father and a husband. And I enjoy watching that too. But I think part of the reason I enjoy watching that is because... I've grown up with Vegeta, you I guess. You went through the arc. Yeah. You, you've already... You, you've you established his character with him. He was edgy when I was edgy, and he mellowed out <laughs> when I mellowed out. But did you want him to, like, mellow out more? Like, there's something... Maybe not mellow, but there's, like... There's something special about seeing, like, Vegeta... The word that comes to mind is almost, like, domesticated. He's like a wolf, almost. Well, He's like thing, this lone wolf on his own. The thing is, and, and I haven't seen much of Super, so... Likewise. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but... Even in Super, he's still rough around the edges. He's not as much of a colossal jerk as originally, but he still sometimes does and says the things that the, the, the heroes, the quote-unquote heroes, won't do. Yeah, to an extent. Um, he mellows out more and more as it goes on, and he's throughout Dragon Ball Z, you're always kind of wondering... Is he even really on our side? Like, if he gets a better offer, is he going to drop us at a moment's notice? And didn't he do that one time? At least one time. <laughs> and a minimum? And You're so, talking about the Majin Buu? Majin Buu. Yeah. So, but isn't the whole point of that is that it wasn't that he was betraying people because it was a better offer. It was because that was part of his arc of, I have to become more powerful. Here's how I can surpass Goku. It wasn't about everyone else in the world. It was about Goku. Well, I mean, for anybody who watches Dragon Ball Z, this will be like beating the dead horse, but Vegeta's fatal flaw is pride. It's the best thing and worst thing about Vegeta. And so in the Cell Saga, which is another villain, um, the key anime trope of why do we always let them transform for five, for 15 minutes while they use the recycled animation, why don't we just beat them up while they're transforming? Uh, Vegeta answers that question because he thinks it would be fun. Like, they have an opportunity to kill Cell before he completes the perfect Cell transformation. And if you don't watch anime, I am definitely sounding like a huge nerd right now. But he completes the perfect Cell transformation only because Vegeta allowed it, because Vegeta arrogantly thought that would make his victory all the sweeter. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to stop you there, though, because, you know, you're you're putting a lot of that on Vegeta, but doesn't Goku do the exact same thing he all does. the time? He does, but I guess... Isn't one of the central plot points in, in Super... That Goku puts the universe in danger just because he wants to fight <laughs> okay. stronger people. This actually leads to a good point. Why, when Vegeta does dumb things, we go, oh, Vegeta, it's what he does. That's how he is. But the moment Goku does anything like that, everybody's like, Goku sucks. Why is he doing this? Why is he... It's the whole, like, the whole, like, Goku bad dad made the rounds <laughs> on the internet. Like, that of, like, the whole, like, Goku's such a dummy. Why did he make this guy be able to get stronger to fight him then? It's like... The goody two-shoes hero doing the same exact behavior is met with derision. But when the villain does it, you go, oh, he's the villain. That's what he does. And Isn't maybe that's, that like, exactly part of it? it. It's like a hero is more hamstrung by their hero-ness. But somebody who kind of colors outside the lines, you're kind of a lot more forgiving of them. Because right. you're just like, oh, that's it's the lovable scamp, you, you know? Have, you have established character. And the established character of Goku is he's going to save the world. So then when you find out, wait a minute, he doesn't care about the world. He just wants to fight a stronger person. <laughs> He's being selfish. That's counter to what you think about him already. But when Vegeta does it, you go, oh, of course. He's that prideful person. He, he's, he wants to test himself. He thinks he can still do it because he's so powerful, because he's so prideful in himself. That's what I expect of Vegeta. He hasn't betrayed your expectations, which Goku has done. But because Goku is the hero, when he betrays your expectations, it's worse than if a villain betrays your expectations. That's a good way to put it. So, to not laser focus on Dragon Ball Z... Well, so, it, just I, 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 I want to keep going on your thought process, but I had a point here, which is... So, if, if Vegeta is one of your favorite characters, right? Mm-hmm. My... My thought process there would be, I can guess another one of 
another character that you really like. Okay. Han Solo. Yeah, I would say that's he's true. He's a little he's more like anti-hero than just reformed villain. Correct. There's like he's not, he's a rogue, he's a scamp. Yes. There is not a a real villain plot for Han Solo. He's no. done some shady things in the past, but not be an outright villain. But he embodies a lot of the same character traits as Vegeta in saying whatever he wants, doing whatever he wants for the most part. Like, not playing by the rules, being rough around the edges. Being a, a not always present dad. Right. There's a lot of similarities. His son's kind of an edge. But they have a different beginning. I, I, yeah, I agree with that thought in that he exists to do what Luke Skywalker can't. He can make the tough choices. He's there to be cooler than Luke Skywalker because he gets to color outside the lines. But I, I wanted to talk about Bakugo in relation to Vegeta because... I thought you wanted to get away from anime. <laughs> no, I wanted, no to get away from, wanted to get away from Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z specifically, because then we'll be here all day. Correct. But I wanted to ask you guys the question, knowing now that I feel like an identification with Vegeta, do you identify with Bakugo? Because... I actually don't like Bakugo, and I don't identify with him, but I'm wondering if that... I do. Uh, and earlier, like, I was someone who felt like I could see his... I also just, in the way that my memory works, forgot that he had told the main character to kill himself <laughs> in the early part, so I got to float on my little personal island cloud of not always remembering all those things. I guess I'm very susceptible to the reformed villain because my brain will just forget the details of what they were doing before. Not on purpose, it's just... You know, my memory is like a bucket with a hole in it. It kind of goes away over time unless I keep keep the bucket filled up. But I always, uh, I kind of identified him a lot in him is that I kind of viewed the anger. And then you never know when how you're reading into a character is how it's supposed to be written of a, of just a, I'm viewing myself as the lowest rung. And if I'm capable of this, everybody else should be capable of this. Um... And just, and like like a combination of that and like holding yourself to a standard. It's just like I'm trying to aspire to this. I'm even if I'm not there because clearly like I mean he has to go to remedial classes, but like Bakugo is one of the better heroes in the class. Um, I don't think he views himself internally as that. Outwardly he's all bombast, but internally it's that like. Well, I'm clearly at the bottom of the rung, but that means everybody else has to be at least as good as me and not better. And I can see a lot of, like, I've done that behavior when I was younger, where it was just like, can't you, like, idiots get it together? I can do just this just fine. Why aren't you getting this? And a certain, like, frustration because, again, internally he's viewing himself as the weakest and worst among them, which is why he needs so much to, that's why he pushes himself so much. And he wants to be the top hero. He's a little sharp around the edges, you know. And I'm hoping that kind of goes down over time. That would be nice, but I definitely felt in in prior arcs with him like a lot of connection and saw that before the show spent time on it and i was like oh i was right the show is showing me that my hunch and feeling about him was correct so i i have to go with ben on this one i that's fine <laughs> I, I like vegeta i don't know that he's my favorite character but i like him i also like bakugo but a lot less than vegeta and i think the reason for that is the attitude. Hmm. Because Vegeta is very much like, for the most part, calm, <laughs> collected, yeah. for the most part. He's, he's reserved. I mean, right. He's soft-spoken his, almost. His, when he's a jerk, he's laughing at other people like, how could you be so weak and powerless? I'm obviously the best. It's like the he has that air about him. Whereas with Bakugo, he's loud. He's yelling at people. He's, He's hot going, blooded. Why are you so terrible? Get better. You you all suck. How could you be so terrible? And I think the 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 reason that that plays so differently, even though they are both, well, one of them it was literally a villain, and one of them has never done anything villainous, truly villainous, while still being a jerk. Yeah, is that it's. It's the personality. It's how they're conducting themselves. Um, as someone who generally doesn't get worked up a whole lot, I uh, 
I don't see myself as much in line with Bakugo as with Vegeta. I like Vegeta's quiet rage, not Bakugo's explosive rage. But that is an interesting point. And that kind of helped clear something up for me because I actually never thought of Bakugo as a hard worker holding everybody else to the high standard he holds himself to. I always thought of him as, wow, this guy's just kind of a jerk. (laughs) But that is a different way to look at him. And I can see because his one good quality is he works hard and he, he does have a lot of natural talent and he's gifted with a and determination yeah he's gifted with a good superpower but he also gets he also has to work very hard he also gets very good grades and as he does mellow out and understand how best to become a leader and complement other people's qualities he mellows out and gets nicer and that's sort of but the main point is we both identify with our villain. Yeah, I feel like it's actually, I want to say first, I feel it's 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 making a lot make sense. There's a reason why you two are closer to the microphone, and I am farther away. <laughs> uh, I am prone to loud outbursts when I get passionate about things, and I feel like I do have that connection with Bakugo, who's just a lot more just, he says what he's feeling, and then just kind of literally, his power's literally explosion, his sweat explodes like a grenade. Uh, and I can definitely see that. And to your point a little bit, Ben, I was, I was thinking about this, it's like, um, I can see the, I feel like a mom saying this. I can see the sweet baby that exists inside Bakugo. <laughs> I can, I can see that he is a good boy. And every, every so often when I go, okay, the show's forgotten him being nuanced. They throw me a bone of like, okay, no, he is getting better. Like the moment when you think he's going to side, the villains are like, come join us, Bakugo. You'll be able to be the strongest and everything. And he denies it in a way that it's like, why would you ever think I would become a villain? And it's like, that's why I have been with Bakugo almost, besides the telling your classmate to kill himself, day one um, of seeing his growth, of like seeing that, like I can see that fire burning in him and watching his progress even more than Deku is really satisfying. Because it's seeing that, it's the, my eye saw that core, that solid good core that he had that not everybody else saw. And in make or break moments, it's playing out that my read was right. And that he is, he is better than he seems. Um, And I think that's what makes him, besides my own connections to him, I think that's what makes him really compelling to me is to see him. It's like, yeah, he's a, he's a brash, you know, loud jerk. He, you know, he works really hard. It's like, but this man is determined to become one of the top heroes like he has a burning resolve for something he's not just here for for glitz or glamour or money like he is here for like it's interesting to see somebody here for being a hero for altruistic reasons but the way they go about it is maybe not always the most clean and i feel like you don't usually see that i usually feel like you see a character is doing something good but it's for money or power or something like that and not like to do good in the world or the prestige of being the the top hero. Well, and I almost feel like the reason I wanted to bring it back around to identification is that's one angle of why I think people love the, the redeemed villain is because first you identify and you think, Oh, he's saying the things I can't, he's doing the things I won't. And then you see him, heal and get better and i think for for both bakugo and vegeta one of their fundamental flaws is they have no idea how to express their feelings in any kind of healthy way very correct (laughs) agreed i think probably a lot of us can relate to that and so when you see them learn how to do it you're happy for them and it's almost like you get a like in the Vegeta case, by the time Dragon Ball Super came out, I was already like 30 years old. And yeah. I, I had gone through my edgelord phase and come out of it just fine. But it's nice to see it again. It, it reminds you that like, yeah, these people can get better. And they weren't bad from the start. It's like you said with Bakugo. It's like, he's he's got problems. But if you really sat down and you could talk to him, you'd find out that he's not a villain because he's evil. His core is... 
is good. And he's not a villain. He's an antagonist. But he's yeah, very... Like, that's a, that's a, a really good distinction to A make. very harsh antagonist. But I think the other... Like, part of the reason villains are interesting inherently is because villains drive stories. Yeah. L- like, heroes who just want everybody to be happy and relax and have a good time, they're not creating conflict and driving stories. You guys... <laughs> I am so happy because Andrew literally walked Ben into my thesis. All right. Isn't that the best? I've had that before where it's like, ah, you you walked right into my trap. It was perfect. All according to Keikaku. Keikaku means plan. So Team Four Star Joe. Yes. That's that was basically my entire thought on this, is that the reason that villains, anti-heroes, reformed villains are so compelling is because they allow us to put our bad qualities on someone else and then re- like apologize for those bad qualities. To say, that person is better, which means I can be better. I can be forgiven for bad things I do. Well, and it, it says a lot about a person relating to a villain instead of a hero because i think if we're honest with ourselves a lot of us are more like villains than we are like heroes yeah because the villain usually gets the complex development and the complex personality and the interesting challenges and like goku goku's just an idiot who likes to fight goku and he's always pointed in the right direction somehow and the thing we're just people goku or (laughs) or or like a deku is the main character for my academia like they're the chosen ones and we don't really have that in life we're just yeah i mean some guy deku is doing our best deku is practically i don't want to say christ-like i guess but he's about as close to a he's a chosen one he's a special boy uh, savior as you can get (laughs) i um i've been thinking about this so much we had we had similar conversations from a while back, but it keeps coming up in my mind because I see this in so much media for, you know, a while now. It used to be, you know, a long time ago that you didn't have complex villains. They were the mustache twirling, you know, snidely whiplash, I'm just doing bad things because I like to do bad things. But in the past maybe 20 years, I would say, there's been an explosion of like, complex villains reformed villains heroes that don't fit the norm i'm going to ask you guys individually who do you like better iron man or captain america i like captain america i'm going to surprise you and say i think i like captain america he's cool because in civil war he's the guy that goes (laughs) no no He's, he's, you think, because that's I feel, I feel like this is, this was a, you've walked into my trap, because I have a feeling you went into this going, oh, Cap's the goody two-shoes, and Iron Man's the, you know, the kind of anti-hero rebel guy. But I, I feel like it plays out the opposite way, at least in, oh, I go back in to what you, I'm yeah. aware of in the comics, but mostly in the, in the film universe, is that Cap's sometimes the goody shoe twos, uh, goody, you know, two-shoes guy, but like, he's the guy that goes, it's like, we can't have this level of control, and like, Tony Stark Iron Man is just like I just want to wrap the entire world in armor, and he's like, I guess I. And he's got he, he. I guess he got over his like I'm a drunk failure pretty well, early and on. And that's the thing. I think my my mistake in asking those specific ones is I was thinking more of like the classic ones, you know, their first movies, and I sort of failed to take into account that they've had these very long. They've arcs. had arcs where they got well, the change. What I wanted to say was I'd refer you back to your initial point about Goku. That's kind of why, like, Iron Man as a character study is a more interesting character. Captain America, if I wanted to watch a movie about a hero, I would watch... As a force. Captain America. As an ideology. Right, is a so if you think about their their first Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, Iron Man, you know, he was building weapons. And, you know, he was a jerk to people... And then something bad happened to him, and he realized, I can't keep doing it this way. And he, you know, he builds his armor, and he saves people. But then in the second movie, he's sort of back into the same place where, like, I'm going to be selfish because I'm dying, but deal with it. 
Captain America, his first movie is basically just, I'm going to keep working hard and things work out for me because I believe and I'm a good person. There's, there's not a whole lot of complexity there. And I think that's something that I'm drawn to with between the two of them. And the thing that sticks out in my head of what I was saying where like I see these characters, these anti-heroes more and more. Even even just straight up villains. Literally villains who don't really get a uh, redemption people are drawn to. Thanos is a, just a straight up bad guy, but people really like him because there's complexity to his character. They can see different parts of him that they can see in themselves. They can see that whole like, why don't we just do something drastic to fix a problem? The weakest part about... Captain America, as as the first movie as a whole, is weak villain. And Iron Man also, weak villain. Well, that's a Marvel problem. But Tony Stark is an interesting character, so it works. Thanos is an interesting villain. Loki is an interesting villain. And I think that's part of the problem. That goes back to relatability and identifying. It works better when you have a villain whose point you kind of understand and the hero not just has to beat them up but also show them why it's wrong and also remind us why it's wrong why can't we just kill half of the people i mean there are too many too many people taking up too many resources like let's just downsize it's not pretty but it it would work and then somebody has to come along and remind us why we don't do that and Thanos isn't the great example. His offer isn't that tempting, and there's a million ways it could have been done better. But, but that's not what the story was. Yeah, it's if you take it on its own today. terms. And I think with Thanos, the more so than what he's trying to do is the way he's trying to go about it and what he himself believes about it. He is, he is aware of himself that what he's doing is a villainous thing that he feels he has to do for a good reason. Yes. The the whole thesis of of mine with these different, you know, the villains, the Examples. the reformed villains, the anti-heroes is in specifically in us seeing ourselves in those characters, making media much more relatable. So, when we when we have a belief that we're saying, like, I know that this probably isn't a good thing, but it's for a good reason. The the ends justify the means kind of thing. I think everybody has some of that, even if it's to differing degrees. And so when you have this media that is now saturated with these kind of characters, you're going to connect to that media so much more. Well, and I think it, it cuts two ways because when you see a villain, you want them to have this relatability that we've already talked about. When you see a hero, you like for a hero to be super relatable to me, they almost have to be like the unlikely kind of hero. Mm -hmm. And there's something in that too of the hero starts out weak and just because they're the the only person who who is there or the only person who can do what they they need to do they rise to the occasion it's it's almost predetermined and just in general usually i think where we go to heroes from that it's like heroes aren't usually fun like the villains are fun when you're thinking about like major films you're like oh like i don't know i'm going i guess i, I know i'm going to the street fighter movie it's like no one's really talking about what, like, Ryu or whatever, uh, you know, Guile is up to. You're going, oh, freaking Raul Julia as M. Bison, the villain, is just chewing the scenery up. They're getting to act and be in a way that we don't get to in life. And I think that's why it's enticing. Even if we would never be that, to imagine that, that whole connection we have to them, that we don't really get to color outside the lines too much, because if we actually did that, it wouldn't be good. Which actually leads to my, like, follow-up, not full-on counter thesis, but, you know, my presented thesis to Brad's point is, 
Uh, and I actually talked about this before long ago on a prior episode called The Toxic Waifu, is that us as a viewer of a villain in a work, let it be a book or a comic or a movie or a show or whatever, is that we do not personally have to deal with the outcomes of their villainy. We were all able to talk about the Thanos snap that erased 50% of people from a purely philosophical standpoint is because we did not personally have to experience that. That just we can't fully comprehend in our brain the thought of 50% of humanity is gone. So it's just not something that we like fully take on emotionally when we're thinking about Thanos as a character or any other villains. Like Loki has caused um, crazy amounts of like chaos and murder and all this other stuff that if it was the real world, we would be super not about. And, you know, I guess we'll go back to, because we keep going back to, to kind of build these examples up. Like Vegeta, we talked about in Dragon Ball Z, kills large swaths of Earth's population, murders a whole ton of people. Like, on top of just being a general ass, he's like a terrible father. Like, he causes a lot of literal pain, murder, and trauma in the world. That, again, if this person was real, we would be like, this is awful, we're not about this. But because it's, we get this... The shield of the screen that we're, that's not our universe, that we just kind of taken on as a thing that is happening. Um, they become very popular. I want to I want to focus on Loki for a minute. Because, yep, that's a good pick. I mean, especially because he now has his own TV show. <laughs> I, I think it's a very interesting use case because the use case. Of, I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> that, but. That's a programmer. And a programmer's <laughs> coming out. It's a what. I can't even think of a, what's the term now. Uh, um, character study? Study? Yeah, that would probably work. Because for for Vegeta, um, you know, when he was a villain, he got defeated. And then they brought everybody back. Like, all those people that he killed, all those people that the Saiyans killed, they wished them back. So Does that erase his sins? Well, and that's the thing. I don't think it erases his sins... But it does sort of come... It, it makes them... There's less le- to forgive. Right. It, it helps <laughs> massage you as a viewer right. kind of turning around on now, him. Now, the thing is, Loki didn't have that. Loki did a lot of bad stuff in multiple movies and somehow was still reformed and people love him. Because he's fun! Like that's, the, like, that's the thing is when you don't have to experience the actual villainy... If you get to see it from like a distance and it doesn't affect your world, people gravitate towards villains because villains are usually fun. It's my M. Bison thing. They're chewing the scenery. Everybody loves Loki, even though he's just a you know he's just a, he's villainous because he is entertaining. He is fun. Every time he is on screen, I'm like, cool. It's Loki. I'm watching the Loki show because he is an entertaining character. I th- I think it's strange though. It's the I mean if it's a somewhat side adage of like it's, you can get away with anything if you're hot, it's still, yeah. <laughs> which I see played out in the waifu stock market even, on the internet at all times. Even though I'm very much saying like we see our part of ourselves in this, I think Loki's so interesting because you know he hasn't really done much of anything to redeem himself. He's quote unquote died a couple times, which he didn't actually. He's sort of made up with his brother, sort of. But he didn't ever really have a redemption moment for real. He never had to until pay for until Infinity War. Or yes, Infinity War. But people War, loved him before then. When he died for real. And right, people loved him before that. And yet he did so many bad things. Things that you can't put yourself in his shoes for. Things he did just because he wanted to do them for power. You know, I would say that goes to the the initial appeal of any villain, which is it's cathartic. It's it, we've all had those feelings where it's like you wake up, you're having a bad day, some guy cuts in front of you, and you just love to ram him, and or you just want to fight somebody that day, but you can't because you're a real person who has to deal with real consequences. You're and, in the bounds of and society. And these are real human beings you're doing these things to. If there, there's a way you can frame a movie such that it's just pure enjoyment. Like, if we didn't have real consequences, we would act much worse. Yes. Like if, we would act much more chaotically. Yeah. Have you played Grand Theft Auto yes. recently? Well, and that's what Not I was going to say, but, yeah. is video games are another form of that catharsis. You've probably done things in video games that you would not do in real life. 
And fiction is the way you get to play with those things. The thing is, though, and, and I think there's a difference between, you know, you playing out something terrible in a video game versus watching a movie where someone does something terrible and yet you later like that person. Because most of the time in video games, now there are ones that aren't like this, but like in, in Grand Theft Auto V, for example, when you murder a prostitute, nothing of consequence happens. You might get a wanted level, you might have to kill a couple cops, but at the end of the day, everything's the same as it was. Yeah. In a movie, like with Loki in it, he murders a whole bunch of people, at the end of the movie, those people are still murdered. Yeah, but we don't see them. But they, he was. But we don't see are, them. We don't have no personal connection. And but there he are, is fun. There's in-world consequences. There's in-canon consequences <laughs> to his actions that you don't get in video games. And yet, there's still something there that we like about him. Well, we don't like him in those those moments. I don't think. No, or, or I mean, maybe we just we're along for the ride. Here is yeah. my counterpoint to our Vegeta to our Loki of and to kind of strengthen my point of if a villain is fun or the side version of that if a villain is hot um <laughs> that we're a lot more forgiving of them uh let me present to you uh the character Orochimaru from Naruto Naruto is an anime about a bunch of ninja people they have superpowers this is this is a running theme in anime everybody has superpowers uh, but one of the major villains of, like, the first part of it is named Orochimaru. He's a weird snake man. He has an entire, like, village of people that he, like, essentially has brainwashed as his minions. I think what he changes, like, he's been alive forever and he just changes bodies. He, like, literally steals another person's bodies. He, like, kills the, like, ninja president of one of the major cities and you see it on screen. Um, he's just weird and creepy. He sows chaos everywhere. He's murdering people left and right. Orochimaru isn't fun. He's not a fun villain. So when he's, when they quote unquote redeem him much later and everybody acts like he's fine now, as me as a viewer, I go, no, this is stupid. He didn't pay for his crimes. Well, and but this is the same thing we just described with Loki and Vegeta. Here is a character who murdered a bunch of people. They were a villain. They went outside the bounds of things. What's the difference? And I'm going to say Vegeta is fun. Loki is fun. Bakugo is fun. He didn't murder anybody. Orochimaru isn't fun. He's weird. He's creepy. He's scary. What's well, all in the framing. The, the... Exactly. But people still like him. What? I don't think he's generally popular. No, I, people are going to like anybody, but I don't think he's as generally popular as like a Vegeta or a Loki. I think there's a lot more people, maybe just in the circles I rotate in, who are up in arms about... Up in arms is probably a strong statement, but like who are like ruffled by like, oh, everybody's just treating this, this murderer, this shaker of nation states, <laughs> this man who literally killed our president by using the dead bodies of our first two presidents to do it. Okay, this is... This is a. I'm. I'm really glad. You brainwashed to women <laughs> because this is this is an excellent point. In terms of who people like in Naruto, who do you think would rank higher, Orochimaru or Kaguya? I don't know who that is. Yeah, I'm bum out of this. You're 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 barking up the wrong tree. Going through Naruto. <laughs> okay. All I have is our like that was all I. Well, I didn't have more. All right, I guess I'll explain it. So Kaguya is the actual end villain of Naruto Shippuden. Sure. So, you know, however many onion layers there are to villains in that series. How many eyeballs does he have? She have, sorry. Three. Um, Incredible. So, the thing is, is they spend a lot of time showing you why she's crazy and evil. They do a whole back, you know, flashback with her. There's like five episodes on it that they are explaining to you. This is why she's doing these evil things. She was abused and it was terrible. You should feel sorry for her. But you know what? And maybe this is just me. Maybe other people on the internet are like, no, I like her. But she's terrible. Is she entertaining? Well, a little. But definitely not enough. And the thing is, Orochimaru has no backstory that you would be like, oh, poor Orochimaru. He's no no redeeming qualities. Right. He literally is just like, I want to know all the ninjutsu, so I'm just going to cut people up for 50 years. Yeah. But 
for some reason... But if he was fun, if he was cool... He's more interesting, and we're, we're okay with him, you know, being part of Ninja Society after he still didn't really do anything, but, like, wasn't a bad guy in the last... Because bit. what he did... I, I haven't watched Naruto. But what he did sounds like it was interesting. It sounds like it was more interesting than what the main character was doing. He's... He's researching this weird occult way. But he's not like he's not fun to spend no, time yeah, with. Yeah, the thing is, it's interesting <laughs> in the same way that a serial killer is interesting. I actually have a bridge point from that then. How many people well, there's there's a there's a level of healthy identifying with villains, and there's a level of unhealthy identifying yeah, with villains. Well, because you don't always have to identify. <laughs> so I've been recently watching through after reading through it an anime called Golden Kamui. I love it. That's not what's important. There is a lot of like true crime bits and pieces in it because the basic thing is that there is this giant cache of gold treasure that's hidden the man who hid it is in prison uh to show where it was he tattooed bits of this map on like a bunch of the inmates and then they were moving them from one prison to another and they all escaped so the story is them trying to find it racing against this military force that's also trying to get them and I just got to the point where I met, where I got to reseat one of my favorite characters who goes out too soon, who is literally like, oh gosh, which is the serial killer that made um, like lamps and stuff out of people Ed flesh? Gein. Who is literally just this weird Ed Gein guy that the military guy comes to and goes, hey, man who's got an entire family dinner table in the back room of stuffed people, including his own mother that he talks to, I need you to make fake versions of these tattooed skins to trick the people, the heroes that are going for this. And this guy who's making, who's doing a reprehensible thing of making skin and like making clothing and whatnot from human skin is literally like grave robbing for this is the most entertaining and like lovable character that shows up on that show for like, a, like two or three episodes or like 10, 15 chapters in the book. All the time, he's incredibly entertaining. He's like this little puppy dog. All he wants is like the admiration of this like military commander general. He's got like these like terrible cloaks made of like human faces and fingers. But there's like, it's the the show like revels in the weirdness of like, this is a really grotesque, horrible thing. But we're like, he's just this kind of like cute, like, like he's, I would almost describe him as cute. Like he is so entertaining when he is on screen because he's got these like crazy monstrosities. Like he sneaks out of the house in a taxidermy polar bear. So I would have to say there, I have thoughts on that. I don't want to get too off topic because there's almost a whole other discussion in why does evil fascinate us? Like oh god there, yeah there's a reason there's I a, could name Ed Gein off the top of my correct. head. Correct. <laughs> like, there's a reason I listen to true crime podcasts. Yeah, and I don't know why really. And that, that's kind of separate from the villain conversation. But are you guys familiar with the Paradise Lost? Vaguely, yes. Yeah, babble. So poem by uh, John Milton, very old, and it's basically the uh, most of the lore out there about Satan. Satan's fall could be traced back to this poem. And uh, some people have criticized the poem as being like way too romanticizing of Satan. Uh, he has this fall. He's kind of a tragic figure. He's kind of like a sexy figure. Yeah, yeah. And I think basically Milton used a villain to voice his own thoughts I think Milton likes Satan, if I'm honest. Ben, let me ask you a question real quick. Yeah. Do you know how many people Satan killed in the Bible? None. <laughs> I believe the number is 51. Is it? How did Satan kill people? Uh, there were various, it was various things. <laughs> Do you know how many people God killed in the Bible? The entire Earth's population minus that family. Yeah. You want to believe the Old Testament? If you're going to keep this in. I don't. <laughs> I feel I like we always come back to Bible chat. We're in Bible corner. I don't know that we can point to Satan as, you know, the evil character. He's definitely been, uh, you know. He's been vilified. Correct. <laughs> There's definitely an, an, a thought of, oh, Satan is going to take you down to hell and torture you forever. But isn't Satan locked in there? What? Why does he want to torture you forever? <laughs> He's locked down there on the lowest level. <laughs> I do. I, I do worry that our our uh, Satan apology here is going to 
make some people question how valid our opinions on Bill you know what are. if we can get some church of satan uh listeners I could, to uh I to get on board with us i'm sure i know somebody i think we'd be fine. i know a few but uh, i don't know something to worry <laughs> no the reason i brought it up was just like that's an example of using a villain to voice your own arguments which is what i think a lot of authors do yeah yeah i can see and that and the other thing I see in villainy with the Vegeta, the Bakugo, there's a certain amount of, yeah, they do whatever you want. There's also a certain amount of, like, they're free. They're free in a way that the rest of us just aren't in a way that we might like to be. And that's kind of why I brought up Milton and Satan is because that's kind of the way he paints Satan is Satan had questions he had disputes and he got his ass kicked for it and his tragic fall just goes on and on that was i think john milton's actual argument but he didn't want to get stoned to death so he wrote a little poem and then at the end he made it about adam and eve (laughs) (laughs) but uh and i think that's probably i think your interpretation of bakugo is probably right i think that's something the author was trying to probably say that i didn't get because i just didn't understand where he was coming from at all yeah and probably the same with vegeta i think people like their villains more than they like their heroes because does it does it come down to a similarity with with heroes in that we see we're 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 drawn to the that it's sort of like a wish fulfillment and with a hero, you sort of get that as a whole from the beginning. Whereas with a villain, you first apply your bad qualities to that. You see your bad qualities. And then you get to see the good side of it, which is perhaps more rewarding. Well, to bring up another book thing, I guess, have either of you ever read A Clockwork Orange or seen the... Cooper I've seen movie. a good chunk of the movie. I have not read it. I have watched the movie. So there's a big dispute between uh, the movie and the book. Because the movie very explicitly drops the last chapter of the book. So A Clockwork Orange is about uh, basically a teenage gangster who goes on these vandalizing, vandalizing and uh, uh, simple assault rampages. And eventually he kills somebody and... Uh, he gets left behind and he gets imprisoned. He goes through this experimental treatment to get out of prison early. And they basically do some like Skinner style behavior, behavioral psychology to reprogram him so that the acts of violence are now reprehensible to him and he can't do it. And the movie paints it, the movie kind of stops there at his deconditioning himself so that he can do violence again. And it's, this weird statement about society trying to impact your identity. But the book actually goes one chapter further in that he does deprogram himself and he does like restart his gang. But at the end, he meets one of his old gang members at a coffee shop or something. And the guy has a wife and he's settling down and he's like, Oh, Hey, my old friend. And they talk and this guy just realizes all on his own that, yeah, I'm, this this isn't really doing anything for me anymore. Like, all this, like, angsty, juvenile violence and stuff is just not for me. And I'm going to put it down and go get a job. Which is a huge oversimplification of A Clockwork Orange. But he's a villain that redeems himself. And it's more about the violence of your early development and then you're mellowing out into a productive adult like when you're young you want to destroy and when you're old you want to create oh ben you're gonna do this to me okay (laughs) so we had touched on this a little bit uh and i guess because you know you had to bring that up i'll I'll out myself a little bit because it's been long enough okay what did you, what did you destroy, Brad? Well, many many years ago, <laughs> Brad you know, went out and committed a little bit of the ultra violence in my yeah. in my early youth. I, I never went so far as to actually commit a crime, but well, you did better my, than most teens. <laughs> my persona that I had adopted, <laughs> so boy, um, was that of 
I'm evil, but only to other evil people, and I'm going to take over the world. I'm going to rule the world. Um, and that was, you know, for a long time. My screen name on AOL was Neo Vegeta. I'm physically <laughs> cringing at these two right now. And I think, you know, that sort of segues into another anime-related thing, which I wanted to touch on in relation to this conversation, which is the concept of 8th grader syndrome. And Ben, I'm going to ask you to pronounce it. Chuni Byo. Okay. And this is something that is is very much an anime trope in like slice of life high school stuff where there's a character who is like dark and brooding. A lot of times they'll have an eye patch that they don't need. They wear dark <laughs> clothes hmm. and they talk about like uh, the power within me, this dark power that I have. Oh, it's going to be unleashed, and and it's a real thing in society. The where, goth weebs. It was my yeah, whole goth phase. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I knew those. I think you know, in anime, they probably take it a little bit farther, obviously, to you know, play it up. But I think that's a thing that a lot of kids go through is this this dark persona phase, and some people have it for a lot longer. Um, I didn't watch but, Naruto the whole way through, but it's important to mention like how hard I tried to get those contact lenses. Like, <laughs> like no, I totally relate to having the the edgy, a little too edgy phase. Um, so you know, maybe I should read the actual um, clinical definition of it. Yeah, and this, is such often, a, this is a thing. Yeah, and often derisive Japanese slang term for the embarrassing behavior of thirteen to fourteen year olds. <laughs> The term literally means middle school syndrome. Boy, we're all thinking it and the Japanese just say it. <laughs> Speaking it. <laughs> the thing is, I think it makes a lot of sense in the context of this conversation. Because, you know, kids have less of a filter than adults do. When an adult watches a movie and they see Loki doing something bad in a cool way, they connect with that. But they're not going to say, oh, I'm just like Loki. And, you know, but with a, a child, I mean, and these are they children. They haven't lived long enough to absorb the consequences. Right, yeah. the consequences. Yeah. And also <laughs> just like the, the, the self-reflection to go, oh, just because I sometimes have these dark thoughts doesn't mean that that's who I am. It doesn't mean that I need to express that. And... Oh, I, I just remembered. I I thought of this earlier. I wanted to bring it up. Do you guys uh, know the term "the call of the void"? Yeah. Somebody was just telling me about that recently. What is that? It's basically um, the. I mean, the literal meaning of it is like if you stand at a, on a high place, like at the top of a building or on a cliff or something. There's part of you that goes, "What if I jump?" jump? Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Yeah. And you know, most people, we have these thoughts. We obviously and, don't do them. And we let them go because we know that they're just thoughts. Now, some people, they take it further. But I think that that connects to this because it. a lot of people don't talk about the bad thoughts that we have. But we all have them. We have these thoughts that go through our minds because they just pop in there. And it's not who we are. It doesn't mean that we're going to do something bad or we're a bad person. But we think these things. Ben, your thing about, I want to ram this person. Yeah. That's a similar thing. I think that's when I thought of it. Um, (laughs) When your frontal lobe develops and you get that impulse control. Exactly. (laughs) The impulse control of your frontal lobe. Children don't have that. So you get this eighth grader syndrome where it's leaking out. There's There's some blockage there, but not enough to really block it. And, you know, until... This was for me until I was in my late 20s. I held that persona. My frontal lobe hadn't fully developed (laughs) until then. Oh, (laughs) boy. No, I get that. I I didn't... I didn't have a persona, but like I told you, like my AOL Instant Messenger screen name was Neo Vegeta. I definitely you guys are such edge lords. I know. I know not Neo, obviously, but I that's definitely the, that's identify. the funny thing. <laughs> it, the, the classic trope of of the eighth grader syndrome character is the edge lord of you know this over the top behavior of like dark and brooding, and you know it'll it'll go between you know they act like a villain versus they act like. A, an anti-hero kind of thing but the the thing was is like for me 
you know, I say a persona. It was who I acted like. I didn't, I didn't pretend to be a, a character. Like I wasn't like, oh, I have superpowers or anything like that. You were just. Being I was just you. like, right. I was just like. It was just a headspace. In, this right. was the mask you were doing. I'm so smart. I can do this. You know, people are dumb. You know that classic young person thing. I mean, people are dumb, but you know, more so not knowing that you yourself are dumb. Yeah. No, um, I gotcha. And it it wasn't that it expressed itself as eighth grader syndrome. You know, I bring that up because it's a classic anime trope, but my expression of that wasn't like, I'm going to wear an eye patch and pretend I have superpowers or that I have special knowledge of conspiracies or anything like that. No, it was literally just like, the world is dumb and I can do better, but I only want to take out the people who are bad. You know? It was it was a way you motivated yourself, like in your private thoughts. Yeah, to yeah. a degree. Although I expressed it out loud, so that was the problem. <laughs> I I did draw um, a lot of like little edgy comics. I definitely I'm not even I I am still not at a point where I could talk about how edgy and stupid some of the stuff I drew was. <laughs> okay, so let's take this and try to connect it back to everything. Is that it's like when you were younger and you're in this quote unquote villain estate. Like, when kids do dumb stuff now, we go, oh, kids, and we roll our eyes. But if an adult does something dumb, we go, this is stupid, why did you do this? Uh, and I feel like uh, this is a good segue to the point that I want to make, is that we do that with stories. If a villain or a reformed villain screws up, we go, you're the villain, whatever. When the heroes do it, it's annoying. We're like, how did you do this? You're the hero. In some cases, you've already learned this lesson, and it's frustrating, and with that, I've segued into my contractually obligated segment of every podcast. Brad, play the sound effect. We're getting in my pony van. So. It's really hot in here. It's, I, there's no AC. This is the problem. Is that we have to put the trash over the window, the trash bags over the windows. People can't see inside. <laughs> so, um. It's the show I always talk about, little, My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. It ate up my life for a while. It still does to some extent. So there's, you know, there's the main six characters for, like, five seasons. They're going through episodes. They're learning lessons. It's literally a, a fact of the show that they learn a lesson and they talk about it at the end. Uh, and then out of nowhere in one season premiere, there's a character who appears who's named Starlight Glimmer who has made a town where she has um, mind-controlled everybody into a cult. So she has mind control this entire city and essentially just made everybody the same. Nobody gets to rise above anybody else. All of their ponies are categorized by the cutie mark, which is like the thing that makes them them. It's all the same. It's this great equal sign. Comrade Glimmer. No, people made that joke. There is so much communist fan art of her. Um, and we just go, she's a villain. Whenever she gets defeated, it turns out she's been she's lying. She still has hers. It's a it's a classic cult. The cult leader does not actually believe in the things they espouse. She comes back later as, like, an even more hardcore villain where she's literally traveling through different dimensions to screw with the main characters. And then she is finally defeated. And then the next season becomes a main character. And after that, becomes, like, everybody's favorite character. And, but, and at least in my opinion, like, is just the best. Because the thing is, any time that she screws up now... Well, she was a villain. She was awful. She's still learning. She can say the things other people can't say. If any of the other characters screw up, it's like, how could you do that? You've learned this lesson already. One of my friends is literally on route in his car to a con to give a presentation about <laughs> how messed up one of the characters' growth arcs were, where she, like, somehow is ending the series worse off than when she started. <laughs> Except that's not what the show is about. It was just, she kept making the same mistake over and over again. And it's like, I feel like that's what we do. We, we you know, connect about what we're talking about. A little kid makes a mistake. You go, you're a little kid, whatever. In a show, you're a villain, whatever. You're the bad guy. You're still learning. You're still kind of taking your bumps and getting there. I give you that, that patience to that. An adult who I know should know better screws up. F that. What are you doing? Adult that should know better. And it pisses us off. And I feel like with all the other things we've talked about, villains, there's that little extra, like, the grease along the way that makes it a little bit of a smoother thing for us to like a villain. It's a lot harder for a villain to go, like, to act, quote-unquote, like, out of character. Or be like, oh, shouldn't you have already done this? A hero has so much more space. It's like a Goku. It's like, oh, are we really doing this again? Like, 
uh, haven't you learned this already? Mm-hmm. You know, why are we why are we going through this again? But like a villain, or like when they screw up, and you're like, come on! But like a, a villain, villain can screw up all the time. That was a thing to my other contractual obligation of like pro wrestling. When pro wrestlers are <laughs> heels, which is like the bad guy, they a lot of them talk about like it's a lot more fun because if you if you're a good guy and you're trying to get in the ring and you trip on the ropes. Everybody thinks you're a dweeb. You're like, you're the good guy. You should be good at this. You shouldn't be making mistakes. The villain does it. That's like a character moment. And it's completely different. In one case, it was like a negative as the hero. And it was only a bad thing. And it was like, made people like them less. But as a villain, it was more of like, oh, they're the villain. They screwed up. Ha ha ha. Look at this. Redemption is progressive. Yep. So Because you have somewhere to go. There's more yeah. place to go from a villain than there is to a hero in growth. We value growth. We we do not value regression. Correct. And I think that's the biggest thing. And that's why villains are better for stories. You have room to tell a story with a villain. And, and that's why it's everywhere. It is literally in children's media. Yep. It is such a pervasive thing. And I, 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 again, I don't think it was as prevalent a long time ago. But media, like all new media has this. You have a complex villain. You have a reformed villain. You have an anti-hero. Whatever it is, there is a character that allows the viewer to go, my bad things aren't as bad as their bad things, but then people still like them. So people mm. must be able to like me. I think to an extent it comes and goes. Like, Milton was long, long ago writing about Satan sympathetically. But we've come where a lot of our big IPs and our big characters were invented or heavily influenced by a World War II era. Where there was a clear-cut bad guy and people didn't really want to try to understand the villain. They'd had enough of the villain for a little while. Yeah. They wanted heroes. And now that we live in a time of relative peace, there's more room for nuance. Yeah. I think it'll come and go as as circumstances of everyday life change. You want to understand the world around you, and that's the stories you explore. Because now we're involved in conflicts with multiple sides. There's no clear right and wrong. And understanding the quote-unquote villains of our time is more important than just going in and punching him in the face like Captain America did to Hitler in that one comic. Do you think there is any series that has more reformed villains than Dragon Ball? (laughs) You can't drop this on me at the end of the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I have to think on this now. Um... So just, pony, pony actually has a lot of them. Like <laughs> well, it's literally okay. a running thing that they keep having. Like they're the, they're always the fan favorites and the ones that people like the most. So, like going back, going through Dragon Ball, uh, JoJo. <laughs> well, that's a literally good, every yeah. week, every episode in season in part four in Diamond is Unbreakable. I mean, anime in general is really bad. If they fight the villain. And then the villain's a buddy. Mashal does that. It was just a manga that is a takeoff of, of Harry Potter that's yes. really weird. Go read it. Um, Literally every... Sakamoto Days, which is about a hitman who <laughs> can't kill anymore, so he, is work- so he could marry his wife that he loves, it's and he's working everywhere. at a convenience store, and every time he beats one of the villains up, they become bros, and it's, that's great. It's literally everywhere. I'll tell you what. The, uh, the reason I say Dragon Ball is because if a villain isn't blown up because i spent all even this... some villains that are blown up yeah they come back as if not a good guy at least on the good guy's side i spent all this time drawing and creating this character i don't want to just throw them out people like them they've been around they have a cool design mm-hmm. we'll bring them back that's i was that was the point i was gonna make there's a practical reason there's a reason for it we made <laughs> yeah. this cool sniper character in sakamoto days he's got like a bird I'm not going to get rid of him. He's too cool to get rid of him. Bring him back. This man can freaking read people's minds. Bring him back. That's how they come back around. That's why people are freaking my freaking um, Golden Kamui thing with, like, the weird guy who made a bunch of outfits from, like, people's clothing. And, like, the English planes are coming. Like, he was fun. Bring him back. Why did you kill him so soon? He was so entertaining. He was so fun. Bring him back. And is that what it really comes down to? Is it's entertaining? 
Um, I mean, we had a lot of more high-minded thoughts about it, which I, I agree with, but I like being dumb and pithy at the end of these things. It's entertaining Captain, for, for a reason. If you are, if you are, we'll do, we'll do a little and or thing. If you're the, here's, here's my ending thesis statement on all this, even if I believed all the nuance we talked about and more deep human brain stuff. <laughs> if you are entertaining or hot or God forbid both, you can get away with anything. Can you edit in Dio saying goodbye, Jojo? Goodbye, Jojo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. If you didn't like reformed villains and anti-heroes before i hope you do now yeah take take a moment to, to drop the the dumb facade i was just playing there yeah like the next time you're you're reading a piece of media and you run across uh, a villain whether regular or reformed take a moment think about take a moment to kind of reflect on why you connect with them what about it is you know entertaining find villains that maybe you don't feel that way about that's sort of, and kind of think about the differences. That's sort of what a lot of uh, pop culture talk zone comes down to, right? Is be more introspective. Yeah. Is that is that is that conscious consumption, or is that something else? And just the words together mean what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm willing to give it to you. Okay. I'm gonna take. We'll do conscious consumption. I do feel like I feel like the two major things pop culture talk zones come to is think about this, or there's some middle ground. Usually, there's middle. There's it's it's. Yeah. it's, it's <laughs> um, but I'll, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. It's we presented you some ideas. Take those, find your own. You know, I'm not. I don't think we we are the end all be on these ideas. I'm sure. I mean, as we're we're rolling down, I know I had other things that were floating around in my head that I could still add in. I'm sure um, Brad and Ben have as well. But uh, we're running out of time. Hey, you never know. Maybe we'll have another episode for about this in the future uh, if people like it. Uh, but with that, uh, any uh, closing remarks? Uh, I. I thought this was good. I, I always enjoy these conversations. I'm glad we can record them now. Yeah. Get that sweet, sweet content dopamine <laughs> bump. I like how we're using anime to tackle the world's big issues. I can't, <laughs> I can't wait to see what we can apply this to next. It's the new mission of Anime Club. Hmm, can, can anime solve climate change? Let's not get too big for our britches right now. Let's slow down a little bit. Let's slow down a little. We're at the end of the podcast. We don't got time for that. Uh, and with us at the end, uh, thank you for uh, joining us, everybody listening at home or in their car or wherever the heck they listen to these things. Uh, it is greatly appreciated. Uh, you can find me, Karma the Grog, right here uh, in the Ramble Rousers podcast feed, wherever you find it, or maybe you're listening to this on our uh, YouTube channel over at my buddy's page, Keeping Friendship Magic. Check out his stuff. He does good stuff. Uh, you can also find me and some other dumb things that I make on my, I believe I have a, no, I do have a Twitter now. I believe I'm at Kermit D. Grog on Twitter. The, the letter D, like I'm freaking out of one piece. Kermit D. Grog. <laughs> so uh, for more stuff for podcasts and other dumb things that I make in the future. Uh, Brad and Ben, would you have anything you'd like to plug? Sure. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Ben Boswagons. I also run a podcast called Words About Books. Uh, you can find that anywhere you get your podcast. That also has a Twitter at WAB Pod. And I uh, hope you check it out. Uh, and with that, that is me, Kermit the Grog, signing off. That is me, Ben Boswagons, signing off. And I'm Brad. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>